It is a true honor to be able to introduce our esteemed colleague, uh, the SHOT Chair of Journalism, Professor Lois Raimondo. As you can see by the photographs here, um, Professor Raimondo is an incredibly talented photojournalist. At the Washington Post, where she worked for nearly a decade before joining West Virginia University, they described her on their website as, quote, the rare talent who can tell stories with clarity and force through both written and visual mediums. And we can certainly see evidence of that here. In her work as an international photojournalist, Professor Raimondo has covered everything from presidential visits abroad to earthquakes to war and their consequences. She spent more than a decade reporting from Tibet, India, China, and Vietnam. And while in Vietnam, she was the chief photographer for the Associated Press Hanoi Bureau. She's documented the war in Afghanistan, and you can see that on the first floor. Some of those photographs are included there. And while there, she captured moments from deep inside the war zone, but she also captured photographs of families in that region, of women, of children, of what she would call the moments less seen, the stories less told. In addition to her work at the Washington Post, her works appeared in National Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine, uh, the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, Life, just to name a few. While working at the New York Newsday, she was also a Pulitzer Prize runner-up for investigative journalism. So for these impressive credentials alone, we feel incredibly fortunate to have her on our faculty at the Reed College of Media. But she brings to us much more than that. She is also an incredibly caring, talented, and nurturing teacher. She teaches our students first to strive to understand and to seek context for their work, to be ever respectful of others and of the images of them. By example, she teaches her students to embrace differences and to tap into the common humanity that we share without preconceived bias or judgment. Indeed, she is not only a rare talent, but a rare teacher and a rare person as well. Our College of Media, our university, and the Morgantown community are far richer for her and her daughter Pia Wan's presence. And we're richer still for these compelling and thought-provoking photographs that she has graciously shared with us. And so we're so pleased that you could be here as well to help us celebrate the arts, help us celebrate humanities, help us celebrate this work, and help us celebrate our colleague, Lois Raimondo. I would like to now thank her publicly and welcome her to the podium. Please join me. Okay, so I wasn't nervous at all until you just spoke. <laughs> but thank you for all your kind words. And um, the way that this started was that I, I received a Faculty Senate Research Grant. Um, they read a proposal that I wrote to do this project and they thought it worthy of giving some money. And you wrote me a really great email on the day that happened and you've continued up until last week just sending me encouragement through the summer and it means everything. So. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and um, I want to second all the people that Myra <laughs> thanked for this. I also have to single out Carol Wilkinson, who has been, by turn, the rudder, the midwife, getting everything done, you know, checking paint samples to see if they go on the wall with the latex and if it's going to peel, getting facilities out front, just micromanaging all these millions of details that it takes. Anybody who knows what it takes to get a big vinyl up on the side of a building here, you'll know that it takes quite a bit of work. And everybody else, um, Thea, oh, when we opened the first box, Thea Brown said, it's beautiful, and it was the first time I relaxed in six months, so um, everybody. Um, Marty Golan is the person who did the design for the show, the brochure and the pamphlet, and without her, I couldn't have done it. Um, and also, 
Justin Hayhurst, um, who's a graduate student, first year in the School of Journalism. He did his undergraduate in biology, and he has been unbelievable um, in terms of just helping me on, on every piece of this. Anybody who's had to scan a negative to 10 feet tall, that's a really bad negative, an old color negative, you know that it can take hours and hours. And he was more careful with my negatives than I am. Um, so not only is he like a master printer, but he's also a critical thinker. So I could say to him, but I've made this point with this picture, what am I going to do? And he said, well, I think maybe they'll understand. So um, thank you, Justin. I don't know where you are. OK, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about this idea of fractured spaces. And I'm going to do it in three different ways, OK? And sometimes I'll do them all at once, because I'm going to do it through story. Um, story is what we all share, and I think it's our common ground. And you can go back to the Quran, you can go to the Bible, and the stories are all things that pull us together. And um, that's how I enter people's lives through story, and that's how I come out the other end to try and build bridges to bring us back together again. So I'm going to talk about the photographic frame, the photograph itself as a construction, because very often when we look at pictures, we think that they're true. But the fact is that for every picture that I take, there are 2,000 others that I don't take. And it's really a deconstructionist thing. I'm pulling a moment out of time through my filter and making meaning out of it. So this is reader in the text for the people who do literary theory. Um, and then I'm going to talk about perceptual paradigms. So the myth of objectivity, right? We think that we're objective, but every single person has filters, right? Perceptual filters that we come to, who you are, where you were born, what you think. Um, and we walk through the world with them. And then the third piece of this is how I decided to edit the show for this particular place, for this audience in the library, which is all of you, OK? Um, so let me start with a rock, OK? Because that's the first story on the first floor. In 2003, nearly 600 journalists working for news agencies around the world uh, traveled alongside US and coalition forces as they invaded Iraq. So it was a, a, a program from the president where they embedded 600 journalists to go into Iraq. There were very few people on the ground inside Iraq, so reporting on what the Iraqis were doing or seeing or feeling. And um, it was hard to get information out if you were there. So. After I, was, I, I remember I was in the hospital in New York where my father was in the hospital and I saw these two nurses and I had been out of Afghanistan for about a year and a half at that point and I really wanted to get back because once you know this stuff is going on and it's really hard to live with like bicyclists going past in DC and just seeing things move back and forth and I wanted to get back to those places where I felt like I could be of some use. And I was in the hospital, and these two nurses were standing at the counter, and I, they said, one of them said to the other one, what are you going to do tonight? And she said, well, I don't know. I think I'll go home and probably watch the war. And it just, having come out of Afghanistan, it was just like a knife to my gut because, you know, the culture that we now have of reality television, it was like the war itself in Iraq had become reality television. But we were watching it you know, through an embedded perspective. So I was on leave for the Washington Post that year, and um, Smithsonian Magazine called me, and they said, we want you to go to Iraq for us. Would you go? And I said, yeah, I'd love to go. I want to go now. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to walk the streets, and I just want to talk to the Iraqis. I just want to talk to the Iraqis, and I want to see what they're, what they're seeing because and feeling. And they said, OK, we want you to write it and shoot it. And so the first section of the show, is about a rock. And what I did with that section was I tried to do paradigm tilting. Because if you go around a grid, there's a woman who was imprisoned by Saddam for 20 years, right? In the next picture, there's an Iraqi whose family was blown up by a suicide bomber who is also Iraqi. And in the next frame, it's the Ba'athists who are being brought in by General Petraeus. And so inside one grid, I've tried to just turn and tilt the paradigm so that you see from a different perspective in every frame. Because it's very easy and very common in journalism to try and simplify things down so people can understand it. But I think we're better than that. And I think that if I go out with a question and if I come end up with a better question, then I feel like I'm doing my job. Um, so I agonized over that Iraq edit um, because there are a lot of difficult pieces in it. Um, but I'll give you one example. There's a cafe in Baghdad. It's called the Scholars Cafe. And 
people have gone there for 100 years, anyone who loves books and they love knowledge. And I found this guy in there, and he called himself Santiago. He wore a wide-brimmed hat, and he had a notebook that was a binder, and he thousands and thousands of words on here with their English translations. And he said, this is my walk through life. And at his house, he had stacks and stacks. And he said, for 20 years, I've been waiting for this to happen. I've been waiting for Saddam to be gone. And I was sitting in the cafe, and there's a picture downstairs of this, and a sheikh came in who worked for Moktadar al-Sadar. And if anybody knows who's that, he is the kingpin of like Sadr City, the place where all the insurgents are. And he said, we have this document. So the sheikh said this, he said, we want to translate it. We have collected thousands and thousands of signatures. People put their signatures in Sadr City. We want to have free elections and, um, because the Americans are here and now we can have democracy. And Saddam really tortured these people in Sadr City. And so um, they had collected all these signatures, um, but the US appointed instead people that they knew who were friends of Saddam, and within weeks, the whole city was blown up. But I went back to that city with them, and because I was with those people protecting me, um, I wasn't a target, because they were targeting all foreign journalists at that point. So Iraq is paradigm tilting in that way. Afghanistan was a different story. That's also on the first floor. And for that, I was with the Northern Alliance Army um, on horseback and Jeep and climbing mountains. And it was the winter offensive. And I traveled with them as they went through refugee camps and as they entered towns and liberated towns and as we <laughs> skirmished with the Taliban and then they embraced each other because it's a civil war, the Taliban. It's a civil war, but which we really didn't report much about that and how they just flowed back into the population. So um, that's more of a ride across the mountains. And by the time you get through the first floor, which is in the wake of 9-11, I wanted to give you a respite. So we went up into the Tibetan um, fabric section of the library, which is, um, it's softer. It doesn't mean that it's not a hard situation, what's happening with the Tibetans in exile, but the way the Tibetans handle it, anybody who's ever been there or worked with the Tibetans, they focus on um, the joy in things, and that's what I felt, and that's what I wanted to do there. Um, and just, you know, the common thread that runs through this, when I was living in Dharamshala with the Tibetans, um, the Nechung Oracle, who you see going into trance on the staircase and then in meditative pose, um, Kashmir was under martial law, and I said, I'm gonna smuggle up into Kashmir and, and report there, and he sent for me, and he said to me, well, um, okay, you know it's very dangerous. And I said, yes, it's dangerous, but people are being hurt and nobody can see, I need to go. And he said, um, okay, and he took from around his neck a little locket that he had from his father, who was a very respected, um, a very respected monk inside Tibet. And his father had been killed by the Chinese military. And he took this locket and he put it around my neck. And he said, you keep this and you stay safe. And I said, I can't take it. It's the only thing he had of his father. His father was killed when he was a young boy. And he said, no, he said, you take this and you keep it and then you come home to us safely. And I heard that story every single place I went. This is your home now, this is your home now. And um, you know, so the people who are dying in ambushes in Iraq and in, in Afghanistan, and um, the Tibetans who died in the square in Tibet when I saw them, to me, it's, it's all fractured spaces. And um, you know, when you have these fractured spaces, they can be breaks between things, but they're also places where healing can happen. And I think that for myself, this whole idea of getting back to the myth of objectivity is that we all come with bias and that I believe that as journalists, our real responsibility, the best we can hope for is to strive for balance and for transparency. And so I think it's, when you look at the pictures that are on the wall, I'm telling you a little bit of my journey because if you understand more about the person who's making the pictures and why they do them, then it's a much smarter read for you. And I think that more than ever in the history of the world, we're being inundated with images and they come without context. And it's a really, really dangerous thing. And so I, I urge all of us to, when you get information, find out what the source is, test the source, and keep a wide range and variety of information coming into your life. Um, so the last story that's up here um, 
is the one about the women inside this safe house in Pakistan. And the way that ha that happened was I took a year off from the Washington Post when I was on that sabbatical, and I wanted to work on honor crimes in Pakistan. And it's a really hard story to do because you really can't talk about it. It's very dangerous. You got to keep moving. I mean, I was up in Waziristan and Baluchistan, which are the northwest frontier provinces where it's the stronghold for Al Qaeda. And so a woman traveling by herself, you have to keep, I mean, we traveled at 100 miles an hour at a time, and people live in, in places that the walls are like four meters thick with gun turrets, and you have to travel with an army, literally. I had a tribal chief and an army I was with, and um, it was so difficult to do. And I came back to Islamabad, and there was this big vinyl banner hanging on a bridge over a crossway, just like the WVU banners that hang outside the horizontals. And it said, the government does not condone honor killing. We are against honor killing. This is the year against honor killing. So I thought, finally, that's my in, after like eight months of struggling. So I went to the government, and I said, you don't condone honor killing. What are you doing? And they said, well, we've created this safe house where women are protected. And I said, great, I would love to see that safe house. And they didn't like that idea, but I ended up locking into the safe house with these women. And for the first time, um, people started talking to me because these women, they were all locked up together. They had nothing to lose. The social economic barriers that keep every apart, everyone apart had fallen apart completely. And they had created for themselves an alternate universe to the one that existed outside of the walls of the shelter, um, the shelter jail. So, you know, that was a story that it was hard to get to the women it's hard to get in the women, to the women when you're in Afghanistan. And if you're in a war zone, I'm the only woman because no woman is going to be up on the hill with a camera. So um, that was my way of settling back into the women's world. And I mean, ultimately, I, I mean, I, I thank people. I have to thank my daughter, Pia Wan, because over the summer, you know, she just wanted her mother back. And uh, I disappeared for a very long time. But um, I have to thank all the people in these pictures, because those of you, I know there are a lot of photographers out here, but um, you think about it, at the most intimate moments in these people's lives, they let me in a stranger. And not only did they let me in, but they saved my life on numbers of occasions. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, I had one lifeline to my editor, Joe Elbert, at the Washington Post, who is here somewhere in the back. But um, I had a car battery in my backpack, and that's how I went over the mountains. There's no electricity, no water, and um, I had that lifeline, and that was it. And these people protected me. So, you know, when you go halfway around the world, and in America, all the headlines are about terrorism or a 14-year-old who builds a clock and says, I built it to impress my teacher. I guess they got the wrong impression from it. Um, it makes me hyper vigilant for those sorts of things because of basically all the love that these strangers showed me. Okay, so I think that's probably about all I could say. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, thank you again for coming, and I really welcome everybody to share in any way you can. There's a book here to write in. We've got, we've got a, a Facebook page, which is just facebook.com backslash fractured spaces, and um, we, there's a Twitter uh, handle out there, and, and there's paper out in the front of the library, so you basically can't get out of the library without passing four comments uh, stations. So um, thank you all for coming very much.